Thank you. Okay, um, I'm an English teacher. I teach English in Hackney, in, in London. Um, and I'm sure there are teachers, parents, people who work with children in this room, and I'm sure it's going to come up in the discussion. I'm going to try and keep relatively theoretical in some ways, although I'll probably make reference to education policy and to classroom issues. Um, so, Vygotsky, a revolutionary way of thinking, which personally I think is better grammar than to think, um, being pedantic. But anyway, who was Vygotsky, and why do we actually think the theories of a Russian Marxist who died in 1934 are so important. I mean, first of all, this picture of Vygotsky up there um, didn't live very long. He died in 1934 of TB, um, probably luckily for him in terms of what would probably have happened to him otherwise, which I'll go back to later. Um, he was born in a place called Gommel, um, which is, yeah, um, right in the corner of what is now Belarus, edge of Russia and the Ukraine, um, but at the time was part of Tsarist Russia. Um, which, you know, I was thinking about that yesterday, actually, when I was finishing off this meeting, that, you know, probably less than 10 years later, fewer than 10 years later, you know, most of the Jews in that town would probably have been massacred by, you know, by the Nazis coming into that town. So, it's, you know, it's sort of almost bubble of Jewish culture in, in the Tsarist Empire, which was, you know, massively anti-Semitic. You had the pogroms and all the rest of it. Um, he, but as I said, he came from a um, middle-class Jewish family. His father was a banker. Um, and he was one of the very few Jews under Tsarist anti-Semitic law to obtain a place at university. He started off by studying medicine, but he transferred to law. And he was basically a complete genius, sort of polymath. Um, he studied medicine, law, art, psychology, history. And in fact, his first piece of research was, and his dissertation was on the psychology of art. He started off studying medicine, moved to law, did a second degree at the same time, and whatever. So he was, you know, he was, he was very much an intellectual. Um, he went back to Gommel in 1970, and he stayed there until 1923. And the Bolsheviks captured the town in 1919, um, somewhere near the start of the Civil War. And he was actually representative of the Soviet government in the, in, in the town until 1923. And I think that's quite important, because I think one of the things you find about Vygotsky is that his commitment to both Marxism and to the, um, to the revolution of 1917 has actually been quite underplayed. And um, one of his collaborators... Luria, who he worked with a lot later, sort of wrote about this. And he actually talked about the fact that um, how inspired they were, you know, he, um, he, Vygotsky, people of that generation were by the revolution. Um, and this is Luria. He says, My entire generation was infected, with, infused with the energy of revolutionary change, the liberating energy people feel when they're part of a society that's able to make tremendous progress in a very short time. The limits of our restricted private world were broken down by the revolution and new vistas opened up before us. We were swept up in a great historical movement. Our private interests were consumed by the wider social goals of a new collective society. And I think that is, is really important if you think about ways that um, Vygotsky's politics and his Marxism have been underplayed um, consistently um, over the years. Okay, so 1924, he leaves Gommel. He was invited by Luria um, to join the Moscow Institute of Psychology. And he worked, you know, in the field of psychology, of education, of learning, until the rest of his life. Um, and I think he also saw, you know, the advent of Stalinism and the way in which a lot of those dreams that he was inspired by were sort of turning to ashes. But he was very, very much part of that. And he was a very, very practical part of that. He worked with disabled children on sort of how, how they should be educated. He went to parts of Central Asia um, or he, and planned things that other people, that people like Luria, went off to Central Asia to, um, to actually think about how you educate people who've been brought up very backward peasant societies. Okay, so for example, um, 1931 and 32, Luria sent two psychological expeditions to Soviet Central Asia to look at the close connection between the political, economic and the social cognitive dimensions of human experience. And he predicted the ongoing change from feudalistic conditions prevailing in the traditional villages of Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan to the more modern scientific and collective forms of agricultural production would induce former peasants to think in less, and I quote, primitive and more modern scientific and logical ways about cognitive and social issues. So he was very much part of attempts to build a new society. Um, and he was also very much part of the sort of intellectual scene in Moscow in the 20s and early 30s, even as that, you know, came under greater pressure because of Stalinism. 
certainly worked with the wider intellectuals. He might or might not, nobody really knows, have come into contact with people like Voloshinov, who wrote um, Marxism and the Philosophy of Language, a very good theoretical book about Marxism and language. Um, but he also, he did actually come into increasing conflict with the sort of official line. Because basically, he, put, he puts a big stress on the Marxist method. He's very clear that you don't actually build a, 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 theory of, a psychological theory of learning by just taking Marxist quotations out of anywhere and sort of applying them, um, applying them directly. He's very, you know, he's, very much, he's very clear about that, and I'll talk about these sort of key ideas um, a bit later. And by the time he died of TB in 1934, he was actually coming under quite a lot of attack both because of this and because he actually engaged with Western, you know, if you like, bourgeois ways of thinking and where, uh, about how children learned, particularly Piaget, actually, the Swiss psychologist, who he admired a lot, though he also deba debated with him. And in fact, the sort of dangers of working in this kind of field could be seen in the fact that after Vygotsky died, a lot of the people, um, like Luria um, Zaporet, I can't remember the other guy's name, um, moved out of Moscow to Kharkov, which is some further to the east, and it was much safer for them. And, and I think it's, you know, and I think it was also very difficult for him in the early in the early 30s that he was committed to the revolution, but he was also, you know, beginning to see what Stalinism meant without necessarily having a sort of theoretical understanding of it. And I think I don't know for I've, as a member of the SWP, to me, theory of state capitalism always made total sense from the beginning because of what you saw happening in happening in the Soviet Union in the um, 30s, 40s, 50s and so on. But I think the people in the middle of it, the sort of anguish of seeing what they'd hoped for dying was very, very difficult for people like Vygotsky. And um, again, this is another description of him. He considered himself first and foremost as a Marxist thinker who wished to contribute in theory and praxis to the construction of the newly evolving socialist society. He never doubted his commitment to Marxism and the um, new society. And when, towards the end of his brief life, he was confronted with the threat of, quote, excommunication, he grew despondent and disintegrated psychologically and physically. So I think, you know, he's, he's very much sort of disillusioned by the time he dies in 1934. Um, I think his ideas are incredibly influential among educationists, and I'll talk later about how they've been, why they've been so influential among both on the left and among progressive teachers and educationists. Um, and I think also that, yeah, and as I said, I'm sure people will raise lots of issues to do with school, to do with phonics, to do with testing, to do with grammar, and whatever later in the meeting, okay? Um, but I think it's quite crucial to actually look at his basic ideas and have, you know, the whole thing about how he is actually is a genuine Marxist, because that very much gets downplayed in academia. So that, for example, um, this is from the Cambridge Handbook of Cultural Hist Historical Psychology, so highly authoritative volume, um, but it actually says very explicitly, although, as did all citizens of the USSR, Vygotsky had to obey the totalitarian government, his relations with Marxism were only polite, which I think is total totally untrue. He liked Karl Marx as well as his friends, the great poet Heinrich Heine, without ironic judgments of bourgeois society, but his quotations from other official texts were made mostly for tactical reasons. And I think that is a misunderstanding of where Vygotsky is coming from. Um, as I said, his work was suppressed in the Soviet Union um, from the 19, late 20s, early 30s onwards. And of course, it was barely known in the West, Britain, America, and Europe um, throughout the 20s and 30s. American psychology, for example, was very much dominated by behaviourism. Um, and it was really only from the 1960s that and people began to talk about his work and it began to be revived, um, as indeed did that of Piaget, actually. Um, and his major work, um, one of his major works, um, Thought and Language, um, was, 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 first, was published in 1962. But, and I think quite crucially, in 1962, in the sort of post-McCarthyism climate in America, um, it had quite a lot of the, the Marxism taken out of it. You know, it was quite a event censored version. And it wasn't until 1986 and the um, Kotsunin edition that you really get sort of full version of it. There may have been other ones since, but that's the one I'm using. Um, so I think in terms of books, there are a couple of books there, but Thought and Language is quite hard going, but actually brilliant in terms of understanding his, um, his thinking. Mind in Society has got a lot of the shorter essays in it, including the one on zone of proximal development, which I'll talk about later, and on play. Um, I've also used, which is a very new book, a book called Vygotsky and Marx, 
which is quite irritating in some ways. It's got quite strange ideas. He sort of says, I don't understand why China, a socialist society, is using American psychology, which I think if you look at China these days, you can work that one out. Um, but, um, and it's quite bad on kind of practical on, on movements against oppression. But it is actually very useful in terms of looking at the sort of roots of Vygotsky's Marxism. So, um, and I found that quite useful. Um, so that's the sort of, you know, where he was coming from. I think some of the key ideas that he has about how children learn are really useful for us in terms of thinking about current educational policy, current educational practice, and the alternatives to them. Um, you can criticise liberal educationists on how they use Vygotsky, but I think it, you know, they constitute an actual major critique of right-wing and traditionalist theories of education. Um, I did American theorists like um, Hirsch, who stress that the only thing that really matters is knowledge, um, and I think it's, this goes to the idea that you are pouring knowledge into empty vessels, which I think is very much goes against what Vygotsky thinks. And I think it's also, you can sum it up through you know, two hate figures, um, Wilshaw and Gove, um, the ex of Stead Inspector, the ex um, de uh, Secretary of State for Education, both of which are really talking about the fact that the only thing that really matters is the knowledge that they think is important. And of course, you can have huge debates about what you do and don't think is important. And about the idea that the point of the teacher is to, is to actually pour knowledge into um, students and, um, and you know, not conform, as Go says there, to an outdated model of how children learn. Teachers have felt they need to organise group work, shock horror, in which children talk to each other rather than learn from the teacher or texts. Okay, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, you know, that his um, Go's praise of um, Wilshaw, the ex-chair, ex-head of Ofsted, also ex-head teacher in my own borough of Hackney. Um, okay, so I think you've got those sort of highly didactic theories, which are very much influenced education system at the moment. You think about the SATs, the increasingly meaningless tests that students do at the end of primary school, the obsession with, with kind of meaningless identification of grammar terms, most of which people who studied linguistics don't really either know about or care about. I mean, I've actually read quite a lot of linguistics on and off, and I had, had never heard the expression fronted adverbial till it suddenly appeared in the national curriculum. Um, obsession with phonics is the only way to, to, um, to learn to read. Um, the new GCSEs, you know, as I said, I teach English. The new GCSEs are all exam. They're based on an alienating series of texts which you dissect in detail. I think that very much fits with that, and they very much go against ideas that we would have, I think, about education should be liberatory. Okay. Um, I think just to add insult to injury, the words of Ofsted, the new Ofsted inspector a couple of weeks ago, that schools shouldn't be teaching to the test, is frankly astounding, given it's what they spent the last 20 years telling us to do. Okay. Um, but I, th you know, I think the basic point is that the, you know, the current education system that's been inflicted on students and teachers is very much to do with those ideas about knowledge, those ideas about how you learn, and also I think ultimately, actually, about privatisation and marketisation of education. You know, if you are pouring knowledge into students, it's quite easy to give them um, multiple choice tests in which there's a yes or no answer, rather than actually encouraging them to think. It's also incidentally why. They don't like teacher teacher training, you know, put people into the classrooms, give them a pre pre planned curriculum and, and there you are, and then you sell them the tests as well. So, you know, I think I think Vygotsky is very important in challenging those sorts of I ideas. And I'm just gonna sort of talk about a few of them now. I think first of all, um, and you know, you get a lot of it in both these books, is the way that because he's taking a Marxist and dialectic approach is this idea that children in social settings are not vessels or passive recipients having knowledge poured into them. They are actually bringing their own experiences, their own background, and their own activity to their learning. Um, equally, however, they're not sort of free spirits waiting to be, waiting to be awakened. You know, it's, and I think it's very much a social view of how consciousness develops, of how children's learning develops. Um, and it's through child's contact with society, their interaction, with society, initially with their family, um, and later on with wider things, that they actually they actually develop a consciousness through um, through socially meaningful activity. And essentially, it's, it's quite an important argument because it's a very um, materialist argument, if you like, that human consciousness is built from the outside. It's not generated from inside our brains. Children come into the contact with the world. They make sense of it. They adapt it. They they work we work through it. They interact with with um, 
with the outside world and they transform themselves, they mature, if you like, in the process. And I think the role of the adult, initially the parents, and in, certainly in current class society, particularly the mother, um, but you know, later others, including teachers, is absolutely crucial in terms of how children develop consciousness. And if you think about the very few examples of feral children that have been discovered, you know, it is, um, what, I can't remember the name of the place in France, but the wild child of um, wherever it is, um, is, you know, child who was, was brought up in the woods by animals, you know, found it very difficult later on in life to develop thought and speech simply because they had lacked that social contact with contact interaction with people. I think the other thing that comes into that is the idea of talk. Um, and again, this is something that right-wing educationalists don't actually think is quite important, you know, think back to that quote up there, um, you know, why would we want children to talk to each other, they just need to hear it from the teacher. And I think for us it's very much, um, it's, it's very much the opposite. And I think it's quite a good um, background to this, you know, the Greek, Greek philosophers, for example, were very much aware of the sort of issues around talk and about writing. Socrates, for example, actually mistrusted the spoken word. You know, he said actually, among other things, it, it discouraged a, a respect for memory. Um, but also, I think the thing he stressed about, um, about talk is that talk implies dialogue. It implies talking, it's listening to people, and so on and so forth. And in fact, if you look at all Plato's, um, virtually all Plato's works, they're virtually all written, aren't they, as as dialogues. So I th and I think Vygotsky takes up that idea of dialogue and exploratory talk being central to human development and to how children learn because of this idea that consciousness develops from the outside. I think it's also why stimulating environments are really important for young children. And actually one of the, one of the achievements actually of New Labour was the Sure Start Centres, which were aimed at giving children, um, children a sort of, a well, a Sure Start literally, very early intervention, um, getting them into set settings where they'd be interacting with other children, with experiencing rich play and whatever. And, um, you know, obviously the condemns and now the, the Tory government in the last couple of years um, closed a lot of those down. And I think that was a major attack on the idea that we want to, want to encourage children to engage in rich and stimulating environments. <coughs> so I think in terms of language and talk, for Vygotsky, the idea of language and talk is basically a tool. And he uses this idea of tools, and particularly psychological tools, as a sort of mediating activity. Um, which he takes from Engels, actually, in, you know, when Engels talks about humans, how humans developed, um, he, talk, he talks about how humans start to use tools and start to develop consciousness. And I think Vygotsky develops this idea of psychological tools, gestures, sign systems, uh, mnemonics, and most important, importantly, um, about language. Which is not to say, by the way, there aren't other forms of thinking besides what he calls verbal thought. You know, there's practical forms of thinking, how you actually make things or, or perceive things visually and all the rest of it. Um, but he, for him, I think the idea, the point about language and dialogue was absolutely um, central. So, um, in thought and language, he actually is very specific that thought and language develop from two separate streams. You know, they're not the same thing. And actually, one of the ways in which children learn and develop concepts is as those two things come together as thought meets language and actually trans tra they, they transform each other if you like and I think you can sort of see that if you think about if you're trying to think through something really difficult you know and you're kind of grappling with it and you try to express it and it doesn't come out right and then you carry on talking and actually the sort of thought and the t thought and the language come together and you clarify your ideas literally in the thought in the process of discussion or sometimes thinking aloud I'll go back to egocentric speech. So, so I think that, you know, that's another reason why he's very much into that idea of the social interaction and bringing children together with other people. Um, if you're thinking about language as a psychological tool, the key lies in word meaning and, and how, children, how children sort of grow into an understanding. If you think about how children learn language, they don't learn it as a concept. They don't start with the concept that we might have as Adults. So if you think, for example, that a child points at something and says sunflower, that's got a specific meaning to us, of, you know, a yellow flower which stands up tall and all the rest of it. For a child, it's much more of a label. They could equally well apply that label to another flower or to, or to something else that grows. And I think one thing that Vygotsky looks at is that children make a transition from sort of pointing and naming up to a more sort of mature kind of thinking. And initially, he defines that as spontaneous concepts. In other words, the idea that a child interacts with the world, hears language, points at things. Later on, as you get into um, 
get into education, you also get the idea of more formalised concepts. And when Vygotsky gets to um, schooling and education, or early education, if you like, he does a whole series of experiments, and that is a picture of one of his experiments. Um, he used blocks of different shapes and colours, and he asked children to sort them out, and he investigated concept formation and different ways in which students are, uh, children arrange them. So to start with, they just put them in heaps, and he calls that a vague syncretic, sorry, syncretic conglomeration. And so it argues that the links between them are sort of unstable and arbitrary. But as they, as a child learns and concepts begin to grow closer to mature concept formation, um, they eventually become a much more sophisticated and developed concepts. He goes through a whole sort of thing about pseudo concepts and fully mature concepts. But but basically, it's the idea that um, you you learn through, you sort of grow through it and you transform it, if you like. Um, and Thought and Language spends an awful lot of time talking about both these experiments and also the sort of sustained engagement with other theorists of child learning, particularly Piaget, um, who he, you know, I think Vygotsky has a lot of respect for Piaget. He engages in quite a lot of detail with his ideas, but he also challenges him. He says that, you know, Piaget's got an abstract idea of development. He calls it the ch timelessly childish as opposed to the historically ch childish which would be rooted in the way children grow up. In other words, children in different societies, different situations, grow up in different ways. And he also rejects the Piagetian idea that children need to grow out of false ways of thinking, thinking and concept making and learn adult ones. What he argues is they don't need to grow out of them, they need to transform them in a dialectical manner, you know, and I think there's a difference. Um, part of his debate, actually, with Piaget is that idea of egocentric speech, which I referred to earlier and what that means is basically if you look at young children they will quite often um, use egocentric speech basically thinking aloud you know and you look at children doing that literally as they're actually undertaking an activity because it helps them think um, and it gets them to think things through and actually I think we do it as adults if you're trying to work something out I know I sometimes you know sit and talk, talk to myself um, and Piaget actually saw this as a kind of autism um, whereas Vygotsky saw it as part of the process of how a child builds him or herself from the outside and from the social. And what eventually happens as they mature is that their speech separates out into communication and in what he calls inner speech, inner thinking, in other words. And I think this takes us on to one of the most kind of certainly well-known ideas of Vygotsky, the idea of the zone of proximal development, okay, which is very popular in current educational thinking, and I'll go back to that in a second. But basically, it's the idea that when you get to educate, when you, when you are educating a child, and that could be informally or formally within a sort of school or nursery setting, is that to develop the, your higher mental functions, um, you, um, you need to, you actually need to come into contact with other people and with, and with, and with what the teachers can do. Um, okay. Um, as I said, it's it's not you know it's not necessarily used in a particularly radical way. It was um, this, you know Off Ofsted again, for example, have actually referred to the zone of proximal development as as a useful tool for thinking. And to be honest, actually, some of Ofsted's publications do actually are actually quite sensible in a kind of reformist kind of way. Um, as an institution, they're appalling, but some of the documentation research they put out is is actually quite serious. Um, and also, many of the people, for example, who planned the, what was called the National Strategies 10, 12 years ago, literacy and numeracy, they, you know, the, and um, arguments around what's called assessment of learning in schools, they do actually claim to be inspired by Vygotsky. I think the issue is not that they're, they're wrong at one level, it's just that they don't take it very far. It's very much about adapting children to, to our current society rather than challenging, challenging it. So, so if you're thinking about going back to the zone of proximal development, Think about how Vygotsky looks at this social and historical nature of child <coughs> development and how a child starts and how a child starts to learning what he calls scientific concepts, basically formalised ways of thinking. And I think, you know, it's that idea he stresses that children don't start as blank slates. So for example, they start learning arithmetic, maths, but they have a, have a, some idea of quantity. You know, they probably can count a bit, they, they've put, they can number things and all the rest of it. So that's one reason why he argues that learning is experiential and activity-based, because you, you, know, you start with a child's activity. But, and I think crucially, the child might have experience of number, might have practical experience of it, but actually they need, they, that needs to be mediated and transformed by scientific concepts. 
And in a sense, he talks about things going in two directions. The child is working upwards with their experience, and the adult or the external or whoever is the teacher or other adults is coming downwards with the concepts. And, um, and that is where the zone of proximal development comes on the board. And he defines it, and you can find the essay in Mind and Society. Um, he defines it as a distance between the actual develop, developmental level as determined by independent problem solving and the level of potential development as determined through problem solving under adult guidance or in collaboration with more capable peers. So the example he gives is two 10-year-old children who appear to be achieving the same the same and work independently at the level of an eight-year-old. Okay, um, This would be sort of testing that they'd be doing at the time he was writing. However, when, support, when, when they're supported by an adult, you know, you're putting a bit of extra help, you're making some suggestions, one achieves at the level of a nine-year-old, one at a 12-year-old. And what he's saying about is that learning and supporting a child isn't about just inputting something, sitting back and see if they can do it. It's about it's collaborative and it's about the teacher or other people working with the child and seeing where they need to go next. So it's not about sort of summative, you can do this, you failed your SATs, you've passed your SATs or your GCSEs or whatever. It's actually looking at where they've got to, where they can get to with some intervention. You know, and that's quite, that's a really powerful concept. If you think about the fact you've got a child who's struggling with something, do you just leave them to get on with it on their own? Obviously you don't. Do you just do it for them? They're not going to learn. But actually you put in a bit of extra information and that is what enables them to do it. And I remember actually watching a maths lesson at school, which I couldn't kind of follow. And I was desperately trying to remember, um, you know, from when I was at school. And the teacher then suddenly said something and I thought, ah, that's it. And it was the, it was the outside intervention that enabled me to then be able to do the rest of it. So, and, and I think if you think about that, and traditional style testing, they're always about looking backwards at what they've done and what they can't do and not actually supporting them rather than thinking about how you can extend a child, lead them forward and allow them to develop. Fairly obviously that doesn't fit with the ideas of league tables and pass and fail and all the rest of it. It also goes, to, um, I think, very well with the idea of peer support. And if you think back to Gove and Wilshire at the, at the start, talking about, you know, children don't need to talk to each other, they just need to listen to the teacher. I think it's that idea that a cooperative model, and um, I would argue a mixed ability model, is actually much, is, 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 um, is really important in enabling students to learn from each other rather than that. It is actually one of the underlying ideas in assessment for learning, but, but I think assessment for learning and the original research on it, people can talk about this, um, has been rather replaced in schools by a complete obsession with telling students you are at this level and this is what you need to do to progress to the next level, um, or whatever we're calling them these days. So, and I think that really fits with the idea of group work of, um, and also actually of, of mixed ability. And I think as socialists, we're very much in favour of mixed ability anyway, both because of the gender, class and racial divides that you get whenever you start setting. You look at work of people like David Gilborn um, at the Institute of Education on, on the effects of that. But I think it also is quite important in thinking that if you're actually going to do mixed ability, um, and there's a major, major research going on about mixed ability and setting at the Institute at the moment, actually, which sounds quite interesting. But if you're going to, get, going to do well-structured mixed ability teaching, it's not about just putting kids, children in a group and then just leaving them to talk, talk. It is also about actually how you support them and how they support each other and how you structure it. Um, I mean, I first read Vygotsky, actually, when I was during the first Gulf War back in the early 1990s. And my students were unbelievably political. We had an external examiner come in who had a complete shock. What are you talking about? <laughs> Expecting like Arsenal or local football team or whatever. I'm going to talk about the Gulf War. I'm going to talk about Islam and religion and what we now call Islamophobia. I'm going to talk about, um, about racism and whatever. You know, they were very political and they had huge amounts of discussion. And actually, what was really interesting was when you looked at students who struggled a lot more, bilingual students, students who at that time were new arrivals in the country, um, it had a fantastic, it made a fantastic difference, that way of being able to talk and discuss and share. It's also, incidentally, a very, very useful for um, bilingual students because, because of the, the way they their thinking is rooted in their own language, but they have to actually be educated in a different one. And I think all of these things have got radical implications for learning and how we see education. And it also, I think, challenges some of the really obvious myths which pervade current educational policy, that students have a fixed capacity in terms of intelligence, that students learn through individual effort and memory, and that tests and ex um, exams on discrete skills and knowledge are the only way to get an accurate assessment. 
and I think one of the most alienating things I've ever come across, speaking as an English teacher in modern education, is a complete obsession with extracts. You know, Mike Rosen has talked very interestingly about how whole stories make sense to children because they actually um, they can engage with them imaginatively and use them, whereas actually there was some appalling educationist a few years ago who basically said, well, it's much better to give children extracts because they can't cope with whole stories. And I think, you know, I think the opposite is absolutely true and very much fits with the Gotsky's um, ideas. Um, and I just want to finish off, actually, thinking about a child's imaginative um, capacities is just talk about play and imagination and I think Vygotsky is very interested in imagination and consciousness and if he'd survived he sort of says in the final chapter of thought and language that really what he wanted to do was develop a psycho a, a, an understanding of consciousness but I think if you're thinking about imagination one thing that Mike Rosen talks about is the way as I said children respond emotionally and imaginatively to a story and um, it's also, I think, to do with play. And again, if you think about the experience of nursery education, early years education in the past few years, it's been very much about the hideous phonics tests and about the, um, what do they used to call it? They used to have to do a tick boxing, I can't remember what it was called. Um, and making students far too young sit down and actually do, do sort of formal education. Um, complete contrast, by the way, to someone like Finland, for example, where they don't start formal education until seven. And actually what Vygotsky argues is that play is really important to children's development because they, they for example, he says that children meet situations when they begin to realise they can't have everything they want or that they have to deal with something. And that, you know, playing actually um, allows them to actually explore the situation and test out the, test out the boundaries, set their own rules and see what works. And also, I think, to sort of detach themselves, think about things from another point of view. And, you know, if you think about that idea of young children being egocentric, it is that idea of them becoming individuals within a society and learning to cooperate. And I think that's one of, and, you know, I'm sure early years teachers can talk about it much better than I am, but I do think one of the ways that children are forced into formal education is actually very damaging for them on a personal level, as well as very educationally unsound. So, I'm going to finish off now. Are you about to remind me? Okay, so um, a quick, that was a kind of very quick run through what I think are some of Vygotsky's key um, concepts. And for me, I think in the end, the most important thing about Vygotsky is that idea of children are formed in a social world, that they form it through interaction with us, with their friends, with others, and that actually that is why we want particular forms of education that can help us look not at kind of surviving within our current hideous and decadent society and we can all look at the events in the last few weeks but actually becoming you know becoming individuals who contribute to building something new and I think that was what Vygotsky was was about you know I think he saw his dreams beginning to vanish even as he died but I think really he was actually thinking in a pr practical concrete way about how you can actually build how you can actually move to a new society in which you are actually liberating individuals within the society that um, liberates everyone so um, I'll finish there and hand over to the chair Hi, uh, my name is Emma I'm a member of Socialist Workers Party in Harringay and a primary school teacher and just really quick I want to say really thank you that was a brilliant talk and on the um, zone of proximal development um, an example of how it's really misused by our education system is that there's um, this accelerated reader um, system, it's an online system which children can take tests on different books and so on, and it actually quantifies their CPD down to a percentage. So as a teacher, you can say, my student has a CPD of 10%, and that means that they need to read such books and then take such tests, and it's just ridiculous. You can just sit with a child, read with them, and then you kind of know where they need to go from there. But anyway, um, I've always ignored that. Um, what I wanted to talk about was um, the idea that you know the current education system that we're, that we're living in and experiencing is set up specifically to um, you know build the next layer of workers, and that that's why I think I mean Vygotsky's ideas are brilliant, but that's why they become commodified. And so much of what we do in education today, um, the testing and so on, it's all geared the lining up, 
the sitting up straight, all of that, it's all geared towards making sure that, you know, kids can go out and, you know, get a job one day. And, you know, the thing is, this idea that now, by going on and getting higher education and so on, and that, that means that you're going to go on and actually be able to do a job that you might feel fulfilled about at some point in your life, that's starting to shatter as we see more and more graduates um, being, you know, forced into casual labour and so on. Um, and I think that's why Vygotsky's ideas are so important because what they were doing in 1917 in Russia and for the period after, the short period after, was actually developing an education for a revolutionary society and for a workers' society. And that meant the demands of that workers' society was creativity, ingenuity, collect collectivity. And you know that's why those ideas were able to take place at that time and why they flourished so much and why as revolutionaries Absolutely, we say we need to fight for a more radical, radical pedagogy today, but that needs to be about a struggle against the capitalist system, because it's only in that struggle against the capitalist system that we can have, you know, the flourishing of the Gotskis of today. So, yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah, John Harrington from Oxford. Yeah, I want to address this point about psychotherapy that uh, someone has raised because I think it's very important to see that the Gotsky's work are not just relevant for understanding uh, child development and education, but they go much wider. They really can tell us a lot more about how the human mind works in, you know, in adults as well. And I think it's important to see that the Gotsky's work is also part of a broader movement that happened in the Soviet Union uh, in the 1920s and 30s. I talk about actually in a, an article in the ISJ this, this month. Uh, this, this quarter um, in uh, about science and socialism and the Russian Revolution. And I think it's also important to realise that you know, there are other thinkers that we can use to understand Vygotsky's ideas better. People like Voloshinov, for instance, who also had an idea of the importance of inner speech and words as tools. I mean, I think another important thing we often get from Voloshinov is that he saw the, the, uh, the psyche very much as, as a boundary phenomenon, as he, as he put it, individual consciousness is not the architect of the ideological superstructure, but only a tenant lodging in the social edifice of ideological science. Now that might sound a bit of a mouthful, I think basically it's saying that, that what, rather than this kind of blank slate idea of the behaviourist that just sees people as, you know, sort of passive objects that uh, ideas are imposed upon, there's a very kind of dynamic, active role to consciousness, and, and this idea of the, of, of, of the psyche as a, a dialogue, I think, is a key part of the Gotsky and Bolshevik's work. And actually, I think that means we can interpret some of the work of other psychologists like Freud in some quite creative ways. So, you know, Freud talked about the way in which um, meanings become, can become altered in dreams, things can become repressed or transferred, meaning can be transferred from one object to another. I think that kind of makes sense if you see that uh, in his speech has got this highly fluid uh, quality. And it's interesting that there are actually psychologists now looking at this in quite an active way. There's a guy called Charles Fernhow at the University of Durham that's trying to understand and study inner speech in experimental situations. So I think it's something we can, we can really tap into, but I think the thing that we bring, bring to this as Marxists is this is very much uh, a, a, a revolutionary way of looking at the world. I don't think you can understand, as people have said, the gods without seeing the, the transformations in society that were taking place. And I think it also means that the consciousness itself is highly uh, open to, to change, to, to, to social movements can make such a difference because they alter the way people think, this kind of dynamic, dialogic character to, to consciousness actually make, it's how we can understand how you know, people's minds can change in struggle. Um, in good, the Glasgow SWP. Um, I just to make, make reference to uh, John's article. Um, the thing that struck me is, uh, about it is that I think it's clearly very important to educationalists, but it's also very important, I think, as Marxists in, in other areas as well. I mean, personally, I work as a psychotherapist. And I'm not going to bore you with details of some kind of theory or anything. Just to point out that in my department in Glasgow, um, even the group of analysts are more interested in what they call the intrapsychic world rather rather than the uh, sort of the in, intrapersonal, the intrapsychic world rather than the interpersonal world. When I talk about the interpersonal relationships in my groups, they say, "Oh God, you know me. I always get." talk about this interpersonal stuff. I think that is a huge mistake. And I think as Marxists, we understand. And there's a, there's a phrase that's uh, in, in John's article in, in the, the current ISJ about the mind existing between people. 
it's a, co it's, a, it's, a, it's a social product. And although we each have our own minds and our own thoughts, actually without each other, none of that would exist. And I think that's really important as Marxists, because actually when you think about what's the relationship between the party and the class, how does the party learn from the class? How does the class learn from the party? Or it, and it, it, it is an experiential process, but it's an experiential process that needs to be made conscious. And I think that all of these things, actually we understand it, it's Leninism. Um, but um, we can learn, I think, from uh, Vygotsky and Voloshinov if we carefully think about applying their ideas uh, to our um, function as uh, socialist revolutionaries uh, trying to build an organization within the working class. Uh, first thing I have got is a, a question. Uh, I mean, I studied linguistics and Chomsky and so on and so forth a long time ago, but uh, I believe language is a human creation, it's not something which is in our heads. Uh, and uh, when did modern language actually sort of come into being, it must be something like... No, I mean, it is a question that's been going on in my head all the time for about, I guess, something like about 10,000 years ago when humans really started creating more complicated societies. Modern language like, like as we know it today. Uh, and then uh, I did a bit of English teaching uh, in Germany, where I live, uh, primary school, and we had this book called Fun. And if you, yeah, if you took it in your hand and you looked at lots of pictures, crossword uh, puzzles and all sorts of different things. But if you actually analysed the book, it was just a, a, a list of vocabulary, basically. Yeah? And it was completely separate from anything. There was no, nothing about nasty things, being sick, going to hospital. All the things which happen in daily life were not in the book. It was just you know, nice things and things like that. And um, what I was surprised, because I, I was just replacing a teacher who had a child, and uh, I was surprised that, for instance, uh, you talked about phonet, uh, uh, phonics. Uh, sorry, say that? Phonics. phonics. I'm not sure exactly what that word means, phonics, but what I was surprised, for instance, uh, if I put words like bit, bat, and bet on the board, they didn't hear the difference. For them, it was all this, I'm talking about German kids, right? Bit, bet, bat, right? And I had to practice with them. I mean, I did it in a fun way, in some sort, but after a few minutes, they actually did uh, hear the difference. Yeah? And I think things, you have to approach children from all sorts of different angles. I mean, I brought uh, some uh, Rolling Stones stuff, I don't know, anything, but, uh, to, to, make, to, to, to have a story, yeah? to actually have a, have a sad story, which, which uh, you know, has something to do with their lives. from Birmingham, Mr. WP. I want to talk a bit about play and also have to ask you a question about um, why God speak. Um, and you said you work with people with children with disabilities and um, obviously the thought and language, a lot of children with disabilities are like non-verbal, so I just want to know if there's any information about that. Oh, um, I'm a play worker as well and um, so I work with children uh, on something called play pods. So I, I'm, it's a great job, it's the best one <laughs> in the world. But, so we, we have a, a shed basically filled with tubes and tyres and um, pieces of material, junk really from industry. And we open it up at, at dinner time and drag everything out and the children build things uh, make things, interact with each other, make dens, the stories that come out, the learning, you know, the, the sorting out shapes, like, like um, that experiment, but in bigger. And that's all in one, one hour of dinner time. I just wanted to uh, make reference to what um, the speaker says about making changes in a short space of time. Um, the children uh, had the permission through these scrapped spare parts to build and to change their environment. And passers-by and teachers are looking out the window at what's going on in this playground. They're fighting with the plastic tubes. You know, it's, it looks like, and I'll quote um, somebody walking past, it looks like a revolution. <laughs> <laughs> and it does, because children are doing what 
They're making the changes and they've had the permission just through this spare part and it spreads that you can see the ideas spreading. So one child's building one thing, that's a good idea. And it's almost like, you know, you can see it growing, you can see it spreading. This is what our, uh, the last, uh, this colleague was talking about, about, um, you know, your ideas and your thoughts changing through action. Um, so, it, you know, like, this is, this is children talking, but also through action. And uh, my last point is that, um, you know, it's, I don't think it's any coincidence that we, at the moment I'm going to more and more schools as um, an, an artist and a teacher that uh, playtime's been squashed, playtime's been broken down. We need to one school, the last school, absolutely shocking. Uh, the children have no dinner time. They have to sit there and eat their sandwiches, no play after, just sit and eat their sandwiches. So the afternoon is chaos. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I came across my classroom when I was in doing sociology in the UCD, and I was challenging the individualism of capitalism, which is um, central to capitalism. So everything, you're a autonomous human being, you go through life just in order to gain and satisfy your needs, you interact with people in order to achieve it, and society is made up of this fact. And I was, and it's been central to capitalism <coughs> since the 16th century when that's how long capitalism been in operation. Um, because pr prior to that, all feudal relations, as you know, which where all property was owned through the kings and aristocracy, and everybody was bound to the feudal system. And um, it helped. And with the onset of capitalism, um, you have to own property. So you have to be an individual to own property and sign a contract to show that you own property, which moved away, as I said, all property belonged to church and state. And in view, so it's a central element of capitalism. And I came across by Koski, and uh, he showed that human beings, as we said earlier on, are social beings. And we are not individual autonomous beings, that's how we get through life. And the other factor that I came across by Kosky was that the way in which we think about things and the concepts we have and um, the way in which we put words on things, the labeling you were talking earlier on, um, is very much culturally bound and depending on the culture in which you are living in. So you may view the world a different way depending on which culture you are in. And I think Vykoski was working very hard on that as well when he was showing on how to transform society from a previous way of thinking under the Russian Empire and moving the socialist way of thinking. So different ways of thinking and viewing and acting. Lots of people have indicated, and I'm struggling to get you all in, so please apologize. I've got to accept my apologies if I can't get you in. Uh, I've got this woman here, and then the woman in the purple headband, so I might have to speak next. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sam. I'm from the International Socialists in Canada. And um, one of the questions that comes up quite a bit in Canadian education is the question of Indigenous education and how to bring Indigenous traditions back into the classroom. Uh, and I know under the Soviet Union, particularly under Lenin, there was a program of re-indigenization re-indig of schools um, in Russia. And I'm wondering, my question is if Vygotsky wrote about this at all and sort of what he had to say about that. Hi, uh, is this on? Yes. I think human society has always been complicated. I think the technology wasn't complicated, but I think the societies that we evolved into in our beginnings as hunter-gatherer societies were complicated societies. If we've ever tried to survive in the environment just with what human beings have got and no other technology, you know that that's got to be complicated. The skills that we have lost. What they were was class societies, but I think language must have evolved along with us in a dialectic. You know, as we progressed our ability to speak, we had to have language in order to cooperate because we can't survive as individuals. We still can't, and we never could. So I think language has evolved as part and parcel of what we are as human beings. And earlier societies, hunter-gatherer societies, were complicated societies. I think the ruling class are really up against it 
trying to sort of maintain their role, because they're up against human intelligence, and they hate human intelligence. I trained as a secondary teacher, they taught us all about empty vessels, and how to tell people what to do, and keep them in place, and test them, and all the rest of it. And within that framework, people thinking for themselves, is insubordination, isn't it? Kids getting bored, asking questions, because we were taught about rats and pigeons salivating. And funnily enough, it didn't really work inside the classroom, because people, human beings, we actually do think for ourselves. And we do naturally, instinctively want to share, we want to talk. And then we have to sort of punish them. And things like ADHD, oppositionism, the way they've medicalised bored kids, the way they've made out that there's something wrong with kids who want to ask why, because they're not acting like pigeons and um, salivating, what's the name? Um, <laughs> I think it's important we have always had different types of intelligence because that's how we've survived as a collective. We have got different types of intelligence. We have got different ways of thinking. And that's something we should celebrate. And to capitalism, we're set against each other and we're tested with the stupid hierarchical nonsense which doesn't serve anybody. I had a question because earlier you mentioned about mixed abilities and how uh, children should be able to cooperate with each other, with each other so that the teacher just teaching. Um, I agree with that, but also there's a problem that students who um, perceive to be more able will, might struggle in the way that other students might, you know, um, question them, like keep like going to them, and in group work, they'll be the more uh, able students will be, you know. Put left with all the work, and I was just wondering how we would overcome this and cater to all abilities. Hi there, my name's Lisa, I'm a secondary English teacher from Sheffield, I'm also a member of Sheffield SWP. And I just wanted to respond quickly to the, to the previous speaker who talked about the mixed ability setting, and I think actually there's pretty good evidence that um, children teaching other children is a really good way of them learning, and actually they remember more of what they have learned if they then go and teach someone else it. So that would be, I would say, is, is, is your answer for that, really. Actually, it's more useful for them to teach other children. Um, what I wanted to talk about though was um, what Jane was talking about, about the lack of training for teachers nowadays. Now I'm still just about a young teacher um, and I don't really know a lot about Vygotsky, so thank you Jane, this has been a really good meeting. Um, uh, but the reason I don't know a lot about it is because I did a graduate training placement, I didn't go to university to do my teacher training degree and obviously that is more and more common now with our young teachers coming in to teaching. Um, and so I think with our lack of knowledge about theory, um, one of the things we can tend to do is not understand its importance um, to teaching. And actually, really the basic reason why we don't really talk about it or do anything about it is because really we're fighting for the life of education at the minute, in, in reality. We've got budget cuts, we've got uh, increasingly stringent testing regimes, we've got privatisation, we've got narrowing of the curriculum. And all of these things battering our teachers down on a day-to-day -day basis leaves very, very little room to talk about theory and to think about theory. And it actually, to be honest, feels like a bit of a luxury to us on the ground fighting day-to-day -day. When, when we've got schools that cannot afford stationery. <laughs> you know, talking about my constant can seem a little bit abstract um, to a lot of teachers on the ground. But what I wanted to say was how important actually I think it really is have these debates and these discussions in the, in the current climate of education at the minute. Because when we see schools, that there's one school in Sheffield at the minute, a primary school, that is talking about getting rid of all of its TAs, all of them. And when we, when we see that happening, actually there is a link there, because they do not believe in our progressive idea of education. They do not believe that children need that interaction with lots of other adults to learn. And so there is a link there. Um, and I just wanted to finish off by saying it's really important that we do arm ourselves with these arguments um, and the theory because we need not only to defend the current edu education system that we've got, but actually we want to build a better one. We, want, we don't want the bare minimum for our students, we want the best possible education that they can possibly have. And at the minute, teachers aren't getting these discussions in school, so therefore I think these meetings and coming to meetings like this are really, really important. I felt it was important to me. Um, and so therefore that is also being part of the SWP for me, is coming and having these discussions and debates. And debates. So I do urge you, if, you have, if you're not a member already, I think it's really, really important to sign up and to continue this discussion and debate in further meetings.
following that last speaker, I'm just looking for my first job as a TA at the moment. But, um, I'll keep the faith. Um, I've just finished a degree in speech and language therapy. We did talk about the Gotsky, but I'd like to say what Jane said at the beginning. There was nothing at all mentioned about you know him being a Marxist. It was you were told it was from Russia and that his work was suppressed and it didn't come out until the 60s. But you were never told. But I've worked out anyway from what they were saying that it come from a Marxist background. Um, on the point of teaching children with SEND and special needs and non-vocal children, I think that working in a group becomes even more important for these children because they learn more visually and from watching and following. And, um, you know, that's something that I find really important. And I've spent my first day in the school um, last week. I'm, I'm having a few days voluntary at the moment to see how secondary school works. And I was in the integrated learning unit and I, it didn't seem right to me. They were taking children out of the classroom for being disruptive or for being, having fights outside of the classroom and putting them into a unit where they were then very much on their own, doing their own work with, our, with one person, one um, high level teaching assistant and one teaching assistant giving them support. And I thought, well, if they can't learn within the classroom with the support they're getting there, how are they going to learn individually doing the work that they were struggling with anyway? You know, start with, with even less support. There was they weren't allowed to talk because they were being seen as needing to be punished. And I just thought, well, look, you can punish them, but that's not going to help them with learning, and it's not going to integrate them back into the classroom. Educators. So I just want to pick up on a point that somebody made earlier about um, teacher training. So I've worked in teacher training for around 14 years now and um, we've developed a, 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 as much as we possibly can of a got skin notion of how teachers learn to teach. And um, one of the, I just really wanted to share some of the things that I've learned. Um, one of the things is that um, teachers when they come into training, I teach on a PGCE programme which is a very condensed programme very constrained on that but one of the things I've learned is that the teachers who come onto that program are generally speaking very very concerned about children's development and it's very easy actually to encourage them with some of the theory that Vygotsky um, puts forward you know it's very easy to convince them of, of the validity of that but one of the things um, that, that we know about new teachers is they, they quickly become disillusioned and that's because in the classroom when they start out and when they go on placement, they find that they can't enact these, you know, sorts of talk, for example. They find that children are, you know, that, that teachers have to teach to the test. And, and one of the criticisms of teacher training can be that, you know, all that theory, it's too abstract and it's not really relevant to me. And so one of the ways that we have, have, have begun to work over the last few years with teachers is to put, um, um, Vygotsky's ideas into context. We've really got to look at teachers and the, the problems that they have and they encounter. So training teachers are working in schools, they've got to show children's progress, children are assessed individually, you know, when we know that their consciousness is social, it's the same for student teachers. A student teacher, according to Ofsted, is supposed to make a trajectory that's individualised across one place and to another. And, and they're graded for that, and it's absolute nonsense. So we've got to put it into context. We've got to talk about changing society. It's not just about Vygotsky and education. It's about Vygotsky and, and, and bringing about um, a, a socialist society as well. The two go together. And, and we found that teachers who understand that are much more interested in, in, um, in, in the SWP and finding out about how to change the world and not just education. Um, I'm a primary school teacher working in Greenwich. I'm just going to jump on the back of what two people said um, about the way that this room set up is exactly how the classroom should be. Although I'm a year one teacher, so when they put their hand up to contribute to a discussion, normally it's, I saw a duck once, which is great. Um, but yeah, the, the idea of the current mindfulness movement, as it's now kind of called, it's obviously been called lots of things in the past, but the idea that no one in the classroom is an expert, we're all an expert, we're all bringing our own things to it, is obviously really related to this and also jumping on the back of what colleagues said earlier about mixed ability groups if you're not aware of Kagan
please research it. Caden groups is a fantastic thing, although it's kind of iffy because you essentially you label children one, two, three, or four, and they work in that four and support each other with different jobs, and that's something I would recommend to everyone. Um, I'm very glad the last person talked about the fact that we're all learners and we aren't all experts because I'll say now I'm not an expert on psychotherapy and I think it's already been answered much better than I could possibly do, so I'm not going to go there. Um, okay, a few things. I think the thing, uh, the issue was raised around, is to do with play and also to do with students with special needs and non-verbal non thinking. And I think that was partially answered, but I think, I think the key thing about, about the issue around that is that I think... It's a, it's a, you know, there's a big movement about the inclusion of special needs students in schools, which actually is quite under threat at the moment because basically people see it in terms of, eco it, economically speaking, it's easier to resource one special school in which you hire children off rather than actually having them as part of mainstream schools. And I think actually the, the key point about students with special needs, including non-verbal students, is that they need the stimulation with being with others. And I think that is, is why that, you know, we should, and why that sort of social experience for them is important, why the play, um, why play comes into it is very important as well, because it does actually allow them to interact. And, you know, obviously they're going to have different forms of special needs, which I'm not a great expert in, but I think actually it's, it is thinking about different ways of stimulating students, different ways of approaching them, what other things you can do. I mean, one of the points Vygotsky makes about play, I was just having a quick look at the very start of the um, role of play, is he just points out that, you know, um, play, he, he says, first of all, actually, Play is to do with pleasure, although he also says that many activities give the child much keener experiences of pleasure than play, for example, sucking a pacifier and so on. But he also, talks, he also then talks about the fact that play, talks about the way play allows students to, children to sort of start to set rules and form boundaries and so on. But I think actually as a basic principle, that idea that those students should be part of a social activity, integrated where they can, supported where they can, is really important. Which takes me on to the mixed ability thing, because I think one thing, again, this goes back to what um, Lisa just said about funding, is actually, if you look at what's happening over school funding and the fight over school funding, what it is doing is reducing education, so-called, to the absolute basics. It's fundamentally at its b rock bottom. It is, you know, it is 30 children in front of a class, one teacher, no special needs assistance, no adaptation for the needs of those students. Um, and people who are working as learning assistants have, are very much the targets of that because they're easier to remove for lots of reasons than they aren't the teacher in front of the class. You know, look at the fantastic fight by the Durham TAs over the past past year, very important. My own school, we've just semi won a strike. Um, I mean, we, we won quite a lot in terms of our strike over cuts at school. We, we've just had a dispute recently. But actually what was obvious was that the, you know, the people they were mostly attacking was the learning assistants, the admin, the behaviour experts, because actually they're, they're easier to get rid of, they aren't that. And I think one thing you have to say about mixed ability is it's quite hard, you know, and you need, it needs to be properly resourced. Um, in other words, it does mean smaller class size, it does mean um, learning assistance, it, and it does mean teachers having the time and the imaginative and intellectual energy, if you like, to actually think of different ways of actually organising it. Because, and I think I said this earlier, I don't think mistability is just like fling students into a group and leave them to get on with it. It's just about how you structure it and organise it and how you allow those higher ability students to actually to teach others, which, you know, which does develop their metacognitive metacognitive skills I think quite a lot but you have to think about it and it's it's to do with resourcing it's not a kind of abstract idealistic idea it has to be rooted in the material resources available to you as well as in the teacher training so and I think that's that's quite important um and as I said there's a sorry there is a lot of research on mixability as well I went to something at the Institute of Education last week actually which they're doing quite a major research. They're looking at differences between setting and mixed ability. One thing that does come out is that if you've got setting, the um, so-called lower ability students, students who struggle, fall behind by a month or a couple of months, a month or so every year. So actually, and schools these days have an obsession with what they call closing the gap, which basically, you know, is basically saying to teachers, you can make the difference for poverty and social class and all the rest of it. But actually, the way you know most schools' response to closing the gap is little core groups. This setting and all the rest of it, actually, it's going in the wrong direction if you actually genuinely want to really support students in, in developing. So I think that's, that's important. Um, 
I think the other thing is that point that was raised about standardisation. And it was some, I think it was Foucault actually talked about how with the development of capitalism, um, there is much less space for eccentrics and different people and different types of individuals. You know, and he talks quite a lot about madness and how, how way people who would be seen as, quote, mad, okay, used to be sort of allowed to wander around, around the place, okay, um, whereas actually once you get to a sort of more stratified sort of society, they become a problem and they get locked away. And I think, I, I don't know, I can't remember much about it, to be honest, but I think it's quite an interesting thought. Um, I've just been told I've got two minutes. So the other thing um, I wanted to, well, a couple of things actually. Phonics basically is to do the study of sounds, okay, and I think they're really useful actually as part of teaching some students how to read. But the basic point about the way the government interprets that is phonics is the only answer, and it's absolute nonsense because every bit of research says mixed methods, mixed children, you know, other things work. And also, phonics can be fun, you know, I mean, you know, it's not that it's a terrible, terrible imposition if it's done properly as part of reading whole books and all the rest of it. Um, and the final thing, um, <laughs> massive question. Chomsky, linguistics, origins of human human speech. I mean, first of all, Chomsky's original ideas, and I say his later books have got so kind of abstruse that I really can't follow them. His original idea was that, um, we, that we had an inbuilt ability for language, and he called it language acquisition device, and when he originally wrote about it. I think the problem with that is that it's very sort of biological, it assumes that you've got inbuilt rules and all the rest of it. And actually, I think the point about language is, yes, our brains are developed to... to to um, develop to um, for language, but actually that language does not develop unless it comes, it comes into contact with society. And it goes back to the point I made about feral children, and I think that's where social, social, and historical examination of where language comes from is very, very important. The debate about how and when speech started is actually ex very kind of complex and whatever. But I think if you take and people can correct me on this, but if you take the idea that Homo sapiens, sapiens, which is us, developed round about 100,000 years ago, society has become more complex, tool using is developing, social cooperation, grooming and all the rest of it, that goes back to chimpanzees, but you know, the idea of human beings increasingly interacting in a more complex way, our brains starting to evolve, selection and allowing our brains to evolve and all the rest of it. You know, I think you could argue speech probably began round about that time, though I haven't looked at recent research. But I think certainly by the time you get to, say, 40,000 years ago, what some people have defined as a human revolution, I think you certainly do have speech and complex thinking of the type we would recognise, because that is when you start getting, for example, art, artefacts, cave paintings, and all the rest of it. I think 10,000 is far, far too late. I think it develops a lot earlier than that. You look at the fantastic cave paintings of in I've just seen ones in France and Spain, so, so, um, 20, 30, 35,000 years old, other one, older ones in, in Southern Africa, for example. So, I, you know, you can argue, and I'm not, you know, I think people will argue, will argue about it forever, about how and when and at what pace it developed, when it becomes more complex. But I think speech has been around for, in, certainly in a sort of form we would recognise, 40, 50,000 years, but probably in a less developed form for some time before that. And I think it's, it's very much a matter of social evolution rather than biological at that point, because it's how it's human beings interacting with each other, which, and I'll finish on this, is really what Vygotsky is all about. I did love that quote about mind is between people, and I haven't read the ICA article yet, but it sounds like we should. Thank you. <laughs> so.